If I was to give a title to uh, this message, it would be, You Can't Live Alone. You can't live alone. You actually have to come into community. And um, how could I explain this? How did I find out this for myself? Well, years ago, I used to do these long trips into India. And uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, just a few days or even a few weeks. It was long trips. And I'm not talking about <clears throat> touring through India in this air-conditioned bus in a comfy seat. I mean, I went feral. I mean, I lived in the villages. I, I ate uh, village food and did all the lifestyle uh, of village people. So... <clears throat> living amongst people for a long period of time that have very limited English, I began to feel a craving for something. <clears throat> and it wasn't my favorite food, and it wasn't a soft bed. <clears throat> it was <clears throat> clearing my throat. <clears throat> <clears throat> that was a craving I was feeling right. <laughs> I was starting to feel a craving for something, and you know what it was? It even surprised me. I started to crave conversation. I started to crave connection with other people, and not just a polite chat about the weather, but I mean a heart-to-heart sharing conversation. I began to crave it, and... um, That was when I realised you can't live alone. Yeah, you can live on your own, but you can't really come alive on your own. You actually need to experience community. And um, this is because you've been created by a relational God. And he's hardwired you for connection. Now, you can fight that. You can resist that. You can pretend that isn't true. But it's undeniable. God is a relational God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he has taken that aspect of himself and put it into you, into your human soul. And we read about this in the book of Genesis, right there at the beginning. That's what the word Genesis means, beginning. So we go to the very beginning and we see these creative acts of God and each uh, creative phase God says it is good, it is good. But when God identifies the aloneness in the human soul, he looks at it and says, that's not good. That is not good. And why? Because you can't really experience life as God intended if you remain in isolation. So right there at the very beginning, God identifies a fundamental need that we all have. We all have it. The need to be in relationship, the need to live in community with other humans. And so I want to say right up front, please don't think that you're any different. Oh, yeah, that's for those people. No, no. If you're a human, this is in you by God's design. All right? It's not something we should hide or deny. God has created all of us with this primary need. And that's why we read of Jesus praying that we'll come into community. Now, please understand, when Jesus is praying for his church, he's not praying for good meetings on Sunday. He's not thinking of elaborate buildings. He's thinking of people coming together in community. That's what he's thinking about. Look at the way he prays in John 17. I pray that all of these people, he's talking to the Father, continue to have unity in the way that you, Father, and you are in me and I am in you so that they are completely United In this way, the world knows that you've sent me and that you have loved them in the same way you've loved me. Jesus is dreaming not about elaborate church buildings, not about awesome meetings on Sunday, although that's, that's a part of it. 
That's the, just the community coming together. That's what that is. He's thinking of people, all right? This call to community, this call of people coming out of a crowd into a belonging is the dream that was in the heart of Jesus. And it's all through the New Testament. Look at this verse, Romans 12. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to play, uh, practice hospitality. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. You know, that's not describing a meeting. That's describing the behavior of a community uh, of people and the, and the New Testament abounds with instructions and commands like that that you can't obey if you remain in isolation. Let's think about it. Love one another, honor one another, help the needy. If you remain in isolation, you can't obey all of those New Testament commands. Our relational God knows we function best when we leave isolation, come into community. Now, of course, we can ignore that. We can ignore that and we can create our own little world uh, separated from true community. But the Bible warns us that that sets us up for an unbalanced, distorted view of things. And it, there's a great danger in, in remaining in isolation. These verses in Proverbs says, He who keeps himself separate for his private purpose goes against all good sense. Look at this one, Hebrews 10. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. This is describing community. You can't obey that in isolation. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially as the day of his return is drawing near. So if I'm going to save us a lot of time by gathering up the threads of all these New Testament instructions and commands about community and bringing it together into a singular statement. And here's the picture we get. Living in community is the experience of knowing people and being known by them. It's the experience of loving and being loved. It's the experience of honouring and being honoured, of serving and being served. We're going to just quickly go through each one of these statements. First one, living community is the experience of knowing people and being known by them. What's, what's the value of that? Well, let me illustrate with a story, true story. You know, Sally and I, my wife were married very young. I was 21, she was 20. And shortly after we got married, we took off to Bible school. We were there for two years and we had our first two children. We graduated from Bible school and uh, now in our third year of marriage, we're actually pastoring our first church. We have, we're learning how to be parents. We're learning how to be pastors. Church is small. I have got two jobs uh, working as electrician, bivocationally. So here we are, fairly new to marriage, new to pastoring, new to parenting. We had more fights than feeds, you know, as they say. There was a lot of tension in the home, a lot of unhappiness. It got so bad that at one point we went away on holidays and we got to the end of the holidays and Sally said, I don't want to go back. I do not want to go back to doing that. And so um, I called a friend and, and he recommended that we go for some counselling. And obviously I wouldn't be standing up here <laughs> married to <laughs> Sally with seven children uh, if we hadn't have worked that out, all right? But <clears throat> that crisis forced us to reevaluate our lives. Sadly, I had pushed my marriage to breaking point 
because I desperately wanted to be successful. And you say, well, okay, but what's that got to do with your point about living in community? Well, did you notice how quiet it got in here when I started to open up and be honest about something? To be known. That's David, in case you were tempted to put me on a pedestal where I don't belong. Listen, if we go on a long car trip together, I'm going to break wind at some point, okay? So, listen, I might be standing up here, but I don't belong on a pedestal, all right? I just happen to be a man that God has called to hold the microphone, do teaching, and do the stuff, all right? So, When somebody is sharing and being vulnerable and honest, we intuitively know we've been handed something incredibly valuable. And it has an enormous bonding effect. Bonding. I've watched this happen time and time again in small groups, connect groups. These people are so bonded because they're doing life together. And uh, this is... Coming out of isolation. Now, see, you can attend meetings for years and have your seat and leave and you'll never have that bonding. You'll never be known. It's true. You can remain a stranger and never come into community. Community is being known and knowing others, all right? And this flows into the next aspect of community. Living in community is the experience of loving and being loved. You know, it's ironic to me how (laughs) some people know very little about Christianity, but the one thing they always know, Christians are meant to be loving people. (laughs) You know, they don't know anything else. But they know Christians are meant to be loving people, which is true. Look at these verses, Jesus speaking, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Uh, John 13, by this everyone will know that you have awesome meetings and that you're my disciples. (laughs) That you guys know the Bible so well. This is how they'll know. No, he says... This is how they'll know it, that you love one another. They'll look at this community and go, wow, what is it with these people? And now we know this word love is a translated verb from the original Greek. What does that mean? It's a doing word. We should not be reading this as an emotion. We must be reading it as a behaviour. So it's fair to say, okay, these people are loving one another, but what does that behaviour look like? What does it look like? What can we expect to observe if this is a verb, not just uh, an emotion? Because we're told in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So this behaviour of loving one another, what is it? Come on, let's break it down to our everyday lives. What does this look like? Well, love is how we behave when we're honestly seeking the highest good of another. That's it. And love is how we behave when we accept that others are imperfect humans just like we are. Listen, you wouldn't go to the oven and pull out a cake when it's half-baked and then judge it for not being perfect. That would be dumb. And guess what? We're all (laughs) half-baked. We're all not done yet. All right? So let's stop expecting people to be what they are can't be. They're all half-baked. They're all, we're all not finished yet. Uh, we expect people to be always there for us. Well, guess what? Only God can do that. Uh, we expect people to never fail us. Well, only God will never fail. And so let's stop being disappointed that the perfection that can never happen hasn't happened. Relationships don't succeed because people are perfect. 
they succeed because people forgive one another. All right. And this flows into our next facet of community. Living in community is honoring and being loved. That's one of the atmospheres that we have around here at Kingdom City. In other words, when we say atmospheres, this is why how we behave around here. All right. Having a culture of honor was actually one of the primary markers that Jesus gave us. When in uh, Mark 12, he talked about the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God. But then he says the second is equally important, to love your neighbor as yourself. Many of us know that. We might even have it as a fridge magnet. But come on now, what does that look like? What does that actually look like? Well, it looks like honoring one another that's this this word honor pastor mark talks about it in in the tik videos that the word honor actually in the original language means weighty weighty or heavy and the idea is like if you picked up some gold you'd immediately feel its weight it's valuable its weight is telling you this is something valuable, all right? And so this idea of honour, when we're honouring someone, we're giving them value. We're respecting that this is a person that deserves value. When we honour someone, we're recognising the value and worth that God puts on every human being and we treat them accordingly. Come on, this is what that looks like. When I see you talking to others, when you observe me talking to am I honoring them? This is, this is the verb now. This is the behavior. You know, t- too often I think we escape by just idolizing the statement without really thinking how it translates into our everyday lives. Look at uh, Isaiah 43. This is God. This is the weight God gives to humans. He says, you are precious in my eyes. You are honoured and I love you. And so the behaviour of honour takes the form of treating others with respect. And how do we verbalise honour? Well, I I think encouragement is another observable behavior of honoring all right the dictionary tells us that when we encourage people we're giving them courage Uh, we give them hope we're contributing to their progress and growth wow I love that I want to encourage people I want to I want to contribute to their progress or growth as a person now how do we identify somebody who needs to be encouraged Check to see if they're breathing. In other words, everybody needs, everybody needs to be encouraged, all right? Everyone needs that. And that everyone is changed by the power of it. Well, you might want to check the person beside you here right now. So you're a candidate for encouragement. So never make the mistake of thinking somebody is beyond uh, encouragement. So when, when we help people feel valued and capable and motivated, then, then this is honouring, all right? And it energises the atmosphere. That's why we love honouring around here. That's why we behave. You know, I don't want, know what sort of attitude you've come from at home and your workplace. But when you come here, we want you to feel, wow, I feel honored I feel respected I feel like I have some value and it's an energizing atmosphere and then finally living in community is about serving and being served not just being served but (laughs) serving as well first Peter 410 I love this verse it says each one each one should use whatever gift they have received to serve others. What are you meant to be doing with your gift? And you've got one. What are you meant to be doing with it? When God gave it to you, what did he, what was his intention? That you started 
YouTube channel or something. I don't, don't, no, no. He gave it to you with the specific intention of, I want you to serve other people with this. That's why I'm giving it to you. Faithfully administrating God's grace in its various forms. Uh, you know, pretty soon this aspect of our community together will finish and we'll go out there and we'll, and grace will take a, a different form in the form of hospitality, in the form of encouragement, in the form, it's going to, and it just keeps changing forms. But it's still the grace of God. You know, this word ministry actually means to serve. It's, it's sort of humorous to me that oh, I want that ministry. And they're, they're thinking of microphone. They're thinking of position and prominence when the very word itself means serving. So to say, I want that ministry. I want to be involved. With, you're actually saying, I want to be a servant. I want to serve. And Jesus modeled this serving heart with that classic uh, place in Scripture where he washed the feet of his disciples. And this is what he says. He says, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash others' feet. Now, no, he's not talking literally. Some of you are thinking, oh, no, are we going to start washing? No, it's okay. That toe jam is, uh, you know, it can stay right where it is. You, no, it is, it is the heart because of the context and the culture of the day. This was somebody humbling themselves in the, in the desire to serve, to bless, to give away from themselves. Uh, in, in Matthew 20, he says, whoever wants to be great <laughs> needs to become a servant. That's what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve not to be served. So Jesus gives this new definition to greatness, which I love. Greatness is the life you gain when you give your own life away. That's what he's saying. Come on, don't hoard it to yourself. No, come into community and you will experience something by giving to others that will make you come alive. That will make you... Come alive. If you make life all about yourself, he's saying, you actually end up restricting your life. But if you give up your life, you'll gain it. He's saying the tighter you squeeze, the less you have. He's saying freely you've received. Now you freely give. And to whom much is given, much is expected. Oh, look at all that I've been given. And so the expectation of what you're meant to be giving away from yourself has actually increased. So we embrace this new definition of greatness, the life you gain when you give yours away. So, so God is working through you. This invisible God is becoming visible through you serving. Wow. Wow. All right. You are his light in dark places. You are his voice speaking into people's lives. And as you reach out your hand, God superimposes his hand over yours. I'm going to ask this, the musicians to come back and help me. So what does the, the dream of Jesus for his church look like for people? Not to attend a meeting so much. That's part of it, of course. But that's not it. It's to actually come into community. Community is the experience, once again, of knowing people and being known by them. It's the experience of loving and being loved. Of honouring and being honoured. Of serving and being served. And so what's the personal application of this message that I'd love for you to not just pigeonhole in your catalogue of sermons, but what's the personal application that I'd love you to take away from this message today? Well, let me answer it like this. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why of all the churches God has connected you to Kingdom City? You think that's an accident? I think not. I think not. 
right? Of all the hundreds of people, God has actually deliberately put you here. You know why? Because He knows, He's looked at your life and knows the soil of this church is where you're going to thrive. You know, when you go to Bunnings and you read that little tag on the, on the, on the, on the plant, you know, this plant will thrive, da-da-da-da-da. Some of you totally ignore that. And the poor thing is struggling. Read the tag, okay? If you're going to pay the money, read the tag. They're telling you, <clears throat> you want this plant to thrive? Here's the conditions it needs. So God looked at you with your stuff going on in your life, maybe moved from another country, and he said, I know exactly where you're going to thrive, the soil of this house. That's why it says, <clears throat> without the, <clears throat> the, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree, planted. Everyone say planted, planted in the house of the Lord. That's where they will flourish in the courts of their God. <clears throat> so this promise of a life that's flourishing doesn't belong to everybody. Sorry. It belongs to those who have been planted. Firmly planted, connected, attached. All right? And so this is not a description of mere church attendance. This is about somebody who's planted their lives in the local church, receiving nourishment from its soil, but guess what? Also giving back with the fruitfulness that your life begins to bear as it's thriving, it now gives back. So what is this telling us? No living thing survives for long if it's kept in isolation from its life source. If we go to the beginning of our Bible, we see the strategy of the serpent was to detach the first humans from their life-giving attachment to God. And then soon after that, the same strategy again with Cain and Abel, the two brothers, and as a result, we're told that Cain became the first detached person ever to walk the earth. And he's described as a restless wanderer on the earth. And so many of God's people across the world today are restless wanderers. You know why? Because they have not been planted. They have not attached themselves to the soil of a local church where God has determined them to thrive. Detached people are unfulfilled people. Now listen, I, I understand that maybe when you first arrived here, you needed some time. You needed, you, at first you were reluctant to get close to other people. I get that. And so what you did was you hung a do not disturb. We picked it up as you walked in. Oh, they've got a do not disturb. You didn't shake my hand. You didn't smile. Mm. So, oh, that's a do not disturb person. We still welcomed you. We still loved you. We got it. But here's the thing. You've been wearing this far too long. If you want to really thrive, you got to take that thing off your heart and say, you know what? I don't want to just turn up here and leave. See, we're going to finish this message in a moment and some of you are going to have to resist the temptation to spin on your heels and head straight for your car. And I can prophesy that if you keep doing that, it's just rinse and repeat every Sunday. You're wanting, God, I want my life to change. I want to go this and that. And God's saying, well, for goodness sake, get planted. That's where you're going to actually get thriving when you come out of the crowd into a community, all right? And this is such a safe place for you to do that, such a safe place for you to do that. So it's time to get that do not disturb off your heart and say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to connect to this community. 
And that's why today we have these wonderful people out there in the foyer. Check it out. There's Krispy Kreme donuts. There's in wonderful people waiting to help you connect either to a connect group, a small group community, or you're saying, well, I want to contribute. Uh, you know, the soil of this house has blessed me, but it's now time for me to give back and to contribute, all right? And so there's people out in the foyer. They're not there to be walked past, <laughs> all right? They're there, standing there, praying for you and and hoping that you will not do what you've done every other time. Head straight for your car, but you'll stop, be bold, be brave, and start a conversation of connection. But before, before we close, before we finish up here today, it would be remiss of me not to create an opportunity for people here today to have the ultimate connection. The ultimate connection is with your Creator, your God. It says in Colossians 1, I love this verse. It says, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see. Everything was created through Him and for Him. Come on. You were created for God. Maybe you've... you've Reconciled, yeah, I can get that I've been made by God, but no, no, the Bible says you were made for Him. That means you are were a deliberate, intentional, relational choice that He made for you to be here. And your soul is restless till you connect, till you bring it home. Home for you. Even though you've tried to take your soul here and there. And it refuses to accept counterfeits because it knows where home is. Home is in the arms of the, your Creator. It, it recognises the one who's given it life. All right? And this tells us that God is not a detached deity with no interest in your life. It's saying he may, you were made for Him and your soul finds rest in Him alone. Look at this lovely verse. It says, we love because he first loved us. God is so cool. <laughs> you know, it's, it's scary telling somebody you love them for the first time. But God took the scariness out of it by going first. He said, I'm not waiting for you. I'm going to go first. I'm going to tell you I love you. This is God, this relational God. And with that confidence, I'm asking you in this moment to respond to the love of God.